we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. Welcome to this virtual forum of Democratic candidates for Montgomery County Executive, sponsored by Bethesda Magazine and Bethesda Beat. Thank you for joining us. Please be aware that we are recording this event. The recording will be posted on BethesdaMagazine.com and distributed to all registrants. I'm your co-moderator and talent, executive editor of Bethesda Magazine and Bethesda Beat. We are part of Zpop Media, the leading media company in Montgomery County. Since 2004, Bethesda Magazine has shared important and compelling stories about the people and issues in the greater Bethesda area, as well as guiding you to make the most of what our region has to offer. It's available in print and online at BethesdaMagazine.com. Bethesda Beat is a local site covering breaking news and key issues, not just in the Bethesda area, but across the county. We focus on county education, county government, and public safety, plus dining and development in the Bethesda area. In addition to advertising, we rely on member support. If you're not already a member, please consider becoming one. At Bethesda Beat and Bethesda Magazine, we strive to serve, connect, and celebrate our community. We're proud to sponsor this forum and provide a means to explore important issues and give you, the voters, a window into the positions and approaches of those who aspire to make our laws, spend taxpayer money, and operate our county government. Today, we are delighted to hear from the four candidates declared for the Democratic nomination for county executive about public safety and education. We're looking forward to an informative discussion. I'm pleased to introduce our other co-moderator, Bethesda Beat education reporter, Caitlin Peets. Thanks, Anne, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll go ahead and get started. Today's forum, we're gonna begin with questions from Anne and me, followed by questions selected from the live chat in the Q&A function. Um, for the first portion of the forum, each candidate will have two minutes to respond to each question, and we'll have 30 seconds for rebuttal if they wish. Once the candidate has 30 seconds left on the clock, there will be a timer that will pop up on the screen, counting down to zero seconds. The candidate will be given time to finish his sentence, even if the clock is stopped. But if he continues to speak past that, he'll be muted by our host. For the, for the questions selected from the live chat, each candidate will have one minute to respond to the question and we'll have 30 seconds for rebuttal if they wish. Candidates, if you please raise your hand virtually with the raise your hand function on the screen um, so we can see you if you wish to make a rebuttal. We're gonna be vigilant about keeping to the allotted time. So please keep that in mind as you formulate your answers. Now I'm pleased to introduce the candidates with us today in alphabetical order. David Blair, Mark Elrich, Tom Hucker, and Hans Reamer. For introductions and first questions, we'll begin in alphabetical order and then we'll switch it up as we get going. Um, let's begin with each candidate introducing himself in one minute or less. You should all be able to see the timer. Let's start with Mr. Blair for opening remarks. Good afternoon. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, so Montgomery County is my home. And there's no doubt that I was blessed to grow up here with our great schools, the wide open places, and um, the welcoming, inclusive nature, which I've always said very much aligns with my values. I believe that when, when a door opens up, it's, it's my duty to reach back and pull the next person through. I also have a perspective of Montgomery County, and I've seen our county slip, whether it's our schools, access to jobs, how expensive Montgomery County has been. It doesn't have to be this way. We can be doing so much better. We live in this incredibly talented community with um, the, the people, the leaders, the know-how, the ideas to move this county forward. I'd even suggest we have the funding to do that. What we're missing is executive leadership. We need to think big, we need to bring a fresh approach. And that's why I'm running for county executive. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Blair. Now, uh, Mr. Elrich, uh, you have one minute. So thank you. Um, in a minute, I'll just let you know a little bit about me. I uh, moved to Montgomery County in the winter of 1960 as a 10 year old. Um, I'm a product of Einstein High School, University of Maryland, but raised my family here. My kids graduated from local schools here. And uh, I'm really proud to be a member of the Montgomery County community. I served uh, 19 years on the city council in Tacoma Park, 12 years as a um, council member on the county council in the last three years. Um, here as executive. I believe Montgomery County has enormous potential. And uh, 
we came into a situation where with a relatively stagnant economy and uh, relatively stagnant housing, and then we get hit by the COVID. So we've been working very hard both to deal with COVID because that was the major problem at hand. But as we were doing that, we've continued to work on planning for going forward. So we've introduced a major climate plan. Uh, we have uh, begun the, the work of trying to reform our police department and in conjunction with some of the work that's been done by the council. Uh, I believe that we have a bright future here. I've seen economic development begin to tick up in the county. We've done everything we can do to try to stimulate the job growth and creation of new opportunities in the county because we believe that in part, um, it's gonna take jobs in order to lead the way in producing more housing in the account, county. And uh, so I thank you for giving us the time today and look forward to talking to you. Thank you, Mr. Elridge. Now, Mr. Hooker, you have a minute. Good afternoon, everyone. I come to this race after 25 years building large coalitions to win reforms for the public interest as a community organizer, a nonprofit executive, a state lawmaker, and a council member. I was elected by my colleagues to serve as the vice president, then the president, to lead the county council and the county's board of health through the COVID crisis. And I'm very proud of how well we work with our residents through that crisis, but sadly, our county has been stalled or declining in too many areas for four years, especially our economy, our housing, and our schools. So I believe the American dream applies to Montgomery County too. All of our residents deserve a safe home and a good living wage job, and we have to address the crisis in our schools and our climate emergency. It's not enough just to say you're progressive. We need a county executive who's actually effective and collaborative. And I've had a front row seat that no one else in the county has had as the elected president and vice president of the council during the COVID crisis. And I've reluctantly realized that things are not going to get better without different executive leadership. I'm not term limited, but seeing these missed opportunities led me to give up my safe seat. And after 25 years of building effective coalitions for the public interest, I'm ready to solve our challenges if you choose me as our county executive. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hucker. And Mr. Reamer, you have one minute as well. Well, good afternoon. I'm so glad to be here with you today. Thank you for bringing us together. I'm Hans Reamer. And before I was elected to the county council, I ran national campaigns to stop Republicans from privatizing social security. And I worked at AARP. I was a youth vote organizer. I was Barack Obama's national youth director in 2008. And I worked for Rock the Vote where I was the political director. I've been on the county council for 12 years and I'm running for county executive because I believe this county needs leadership with a vision for the future uh, and a vision of our county as a dynamic and evolving community. We need leadership that embraces progress and change and wants to seize possibilities for us to become more successful with a growing private sector that will support our equity agenda. I've got two boys in the public schools, they're 14 and 11. And I want my boys to be able to have a chance to live in this county. I want all kids to have a, ch a chance to live in this county and, and grandkids too. And that means we've got to make some changes. We don't have enough jobs and enough housing. And in my work on the council, I've been trying to prioritize those kinds of reforms. And I'm seeing a lot of obstruction with our county executive. So if you want to have this county moving forward to create jobs and housing, to prioritize education, to get public safety right, to tackle climate change, we need stronger leadership. And I ask for your support. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. I'll ask the first question. Montgomery County Police reported 35 homicides in 2021. That's the highest number in at least three decades. The trend was paralleled by spikes in carjackings, assaults, and robberies, and is being seen nationally as well. The violence has especially hurt the Silver Spring area. Are county officials doing enough to prevent violent crime? What are the solutions the county should be pursuing? The order for this question will be Mr. Blair, Elrich, Hucker, and Reamer. Um, our on-screen timer is not cooperating, so uh, at 15 seconds, um, I, will, I will prod each of you to wrap it up. Um, and as stated before, if we're going over two minutes, um, you'll, get, you'll get to finish your sentence. Uh, Mr. Blair, you have two minutes. Thank you, Ann. Um, so clearly, uh, priority for the county executive needs to be keeping our community safe. It's, it's literally job one. And unfortunately, we have seen um, increases in crime across the board. Um, I don't think there's a one size fits all approach here that you can take to the 
the different increases that we've seen in crime, whether that's, you mentioned Silver Spring and, um, or whether that's in our schools or elsewhere. But what it does require is effective leadership. And that's what I've done in my entire professional career. And that is around bringing the key stakeholders together. So in this case, it would be uh, the chief of police, residents, community leaders, faith-based leaders, and understanding the root cause, and then determining what the appropriate solution is, and whether that's um, a special appropriations, or whether that's changing rules. So for example, I think a good example of this, just sticking on your Silver Spring, um, last week I saw a petition that was signed by, I think 600 residents of Silver Spring, and their specific concern was about the increase in crime between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., and how that might be related to a number of establishments that were had hours that were open beyond the surrounding ju jurisdictions. So that might be an easy change to make. But I don't think there's a one size fits all approach here. I think this is what executive leadership um, is all about. And it's why I'm running for county executive. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Mr. Elridge, you have two minutes. Thank you. Um, you know, the rising crime, as you mentioned, is a national phenomenon. It's not local to Montgomery County. And I think most people agree that it has a lot to do with rising mental health issues in a population that's undergone stresses that are unparalleled um, over the last couple of years. Uh, most, of this, most of the crime that's been committed is known persons assaulting known persons, at least in terms of the murders that have occurred in the county. Uh, we responded pretty vigorously to Silver Spring and we've met with um, leaders in the community um, I got a very good letter from, you know, Brian Folger talking about our response and the fact they've been able to see a difference in Silver Spring. We're committed to maintaining what we need in terms of presence to make sure that that difference remains permanent. Uh, we continue to work. Um, we've added teams in Silver Spring to deal with mental health issues. Uh, we partnered with a group that we've worked with in the past in D.C. and increased the amount of staffing in Silver Spring to help with problems on the street, but most of that crime is more of the petty crime than it is the violent crime and the robberies. Um, in the long term, uh, we're gonna have to figure out how to rebuild the mental health system in Montgomery County. Uh, when I was a kid, there used to be clinics that were run by the county, mental health clinics in the county. And those clinics uh, were taken away decades ago and we have not replaced them. And it's a good chance that we're gonna need to reach out and develop that kind of clinical presence again, where we can get more support um, to people in this county. Uh, we're working with the school system, which is working hard, but really struggling to hire social workers. They've been very you have 15 unsuccessful. Seconds. They've been very unsuccessful at hiring social workers, despite the fact that we're addressing this. We're actually looking now at social worker pay. And just like with bus drivers, we'll make the adjustments we need to make in order to be better, more effective at attracting the staff they need, and that goes for the school system as well. Thank you, Mr. Elrich. Mr. Hucker. Thank you, Ann. Um, it's a great question. Uh, you began with uh, carjacking. Unfortunately, the police chief, um, I mean, sorry, the police department, well, fortunately, they've just restored for 90 days the carjacking and auto theft unit. That's, that's a, a good thing because the county executive and the chief decided to scrap our carjacking and auto theft unit um, over the last several years. That's, that's resulted in a very predictable rise in carjacking and auto theft. That was a bad decision. They now realize that. I'm glad they came to that conclusion um, and they're proposing restoring it, but only for 90 days. It should be restored permanently, not just for 90 days. Um, number two, uh, you mentioned homicides and you mentioned Silver Spring. I represent Silver Spring. I have an estate in the county for 15, 16 years now. Um, and it's horrible what has happened with public safety in Silver Spring. Our patrol, unit of, of our uh, third district has been really hollowed out. They have more vacancies than I can remember. The police chief he used to be our commander. He said um, in, in our, uh, that we've had fewer officers in Silver Spring than when he was commander uh, by a significant number. And our whole police in Montgomery County has been hollowed out at the patrol level. Um, we don't pay our police enough. I'm glad the county executive is now proposing you know, raising that. That should have happened four years ago. We're 10th out of 12 uh, police forces in the, in the area. Even the city of Rockville pays its police force more than we pay our officers, which is crazy. We need to recruit the best and the culturally competent officers, and we need to pay them uh, uh, commensurate with 
our high housing prices and our competitive jurisdictions. And third, we need to get guns off the street. Uh, our state senator, Susan Lee, and, and Delegate Lopez in Montgomery County have great bills in Annapolis to do that. But we should have a buyback program right here in Montgomery County. And our exec and police force haven't been in favor of that. They work in other areas. They should work here. We should be paying people to turn in guns because we have way too many guns on the street. There's not too much we can do at the county level. We're limited by state law. But we need to we'd be working with our state legislatures to get um, a, a, a great response and uh, the county as well. I totally agree with Mark about the need for community mental health. We should have seen that four years ago as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hucker. Mr. Reamer. Thank you so much. Uh, we are in the midst of a COVID, um, you know, a spike of violent crime that we know is coming out of many of the conditions of COVID and may have predated, but, you know, families in, in Germantown, in Wheaton, in Silver Spring are, uh, increasingly alarmed, and I'm among them. I, in recent months, we have seen in downtown Silver Spring, to take one example, uh, a, a real spike of shootings. And I took my son out for ice cream about 10 o'clock after a movie downtown Silver Spring uh, about six weeks ago. And it was probably the first time I ever felt unsafe sitting on Ellsworth uh, late at night. And that is unacceptable. I want our kids to be safe, and I want to know that everyone feels safe, you know, spending time with, with family and friends. So we have to focus on the right kind of priority in our police work, focusing on violent crime, on clearing crimes. And we also have to make sure that as we invest in public safety, we don't want to go back to the way things were. You know, it, it, many people don't feel safe in our community, not only from crime, but also from their interactions with police. So we also have to keep in front and center, continuing reforms in how we do police work and continuing investments in tackling the root causes of crime. Violence prevention can actually make as much of a difference, if not more difference over the long term as reactive uh, policing. So in, in, as county executive, that's gonna be my approach. I wanna get policing right. And that means changing how we do things and prioritizing the right kinds of investments. And I wanna tackle the root causes of crime and focus on prevention. In downtown Silver Spring, I think the executive branch has been behind the curve. Seconds. Behind the curve, we've had to have actually the private sector coming to us at the council saying, why isn't the county taking action? Why are they not focusing on the late night venues and the kind of rise of incidents? And it's really it's been us working together with the private sector to push for change. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Um, any candidates who would like to rebut Please raise your hand either virtually uh, or, or uh, okay, Mr. Elrich, 30 seconds. And you're muted. Just a quick rebuttal about Tom's comment about police contracts. We negotiated the contract with the police officers a couple of years ago that addressed the low pay and we worked with them. We knew this was coming. We, we told them we need to address how do we raise the pay. We had negotiated the contract. We sent it over to the council. The council rejected it. We've renegotiated another contract and we're gonna go ahead this time and hopefully the council will pass it this time. But it's not like we haven't done this before. Uh, Mr. Blair. So I lose all energy when I, when I hear that this, these are national problems, right? And of course, we do see crime growing up nationally, but for Montgomery County, you know, the county I grew up in, we were actually leading in areas like public safety and public schools. And there were specific decisions that we made as a county that you really have to question. I'm, I'm pleased that we're bringing, in the, bringing back the auto theft unit, but even the, the number of you know, police officers that we cut from the budget last year, really has you scratching your head and how that relates specifically to what we see going on here in Montgomery County. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Any other rebuttals? Tom, Mr. Hucker. Tom's fine too. Thanks, Ann. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, just on the county exec's point. One, I've always supported higher pay for police uh, going back many, many years. And I certainly will vote. I'm glad we're going to be seeing that proposal soon. I'm certainly glad to vote for it. I've been calling for this for years. And uh, two, uh, county exec, listen, 
you, you can propose something, but it's not enough just to propose it and then throw up your hands and blame the council if they don't pass it. You actually have to pick up the phone and go meet with the council members and lobby for your agenda. Doug Duncan did that. Ike Leggett did that. That's how you move an agenda. And you're the most powerful person in the county. It's not enough just to point fingers. You have to lobby for your agenda to move forward. That's If you don't do that, you're unsuccessful. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reamer. Well, I wanted to just uh, touch on this question of whether the council has or the county has reduced uh, police officers. We have far more positions in the police department, officers uh, that are unfilled. That, that's the problem right now. The problem is not enough people want to be police officers. And we have to understand the root cause of that challenge. And part of that is about competitive pay and workforce housing and all those issues that are reflecting the workforce. But part of that is about reforming how police do their work so that the community actually embraces and supports the mission of public safety. And that's where I'm gonna keep the focus on, on reforming how we do the job to build community trust. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Uh, Caitlin, next question to you. Okay, it seems like I haven't gotten an update on the timer issue, so I will give you guys a 15 second cue as well. Um, so, Mr. Alrich, last year removed police officers from schools as advocates and council members pointed to data showing such officers disproportionately arrest Black and Hispanic students. And after Bethesda Beat reported on video showing county police handcuffing and berating a Black five-year-old. But after an increase in incidents in schools and a shooting in January at Magruder High School, the first in MCPS history, Superintendent Monifa McKnight has outlined a plan to partially reintroduce officers to schools. Do you support her plan? What's your vision of how to equitably support school safety? The order for this question will be Mr. Reamer, Mr. Hucker, Mr. Elrich, and Mr. Blair. Mr. Reamer, you have two minutes. Two minutes, okay, great, thank you so much. Well, this is a topic I'm, I'm very passionate about. Um, I think that there are adults who, when trained in strategies of violence prevention, violence prevention, will be far more effective at building the relationships with our students who are the students who are most likely to commit acts of violence. And when you hear about what police officers are supposed to, the benefit that they're supposed to bring, it's typically about having relationships with kids. And I've got to say, a different professional will be far more successful at having those relationships with kids where we need to know what's going on, where there are kids that are having a beef and it's going to escalate. Trained counselors will be more effective in that role and trained security staff in the school can adequately find out what is happening and whether police need to be called. Police will always need to be called in the incidents of you know, violent, a, a violent incident. Um, so that, that's non-negotiable. But when we think about how can a team inside a school best identify those 25 or 50 kids in a given high school who are perhaps more prone to violence, who need a bit more attention and focus, an adult not wearing a badge and a gun is going to be more effective at doing that. So that has continues to be my strong approach here is let's hire the right kinds of professionals and then work together in a school building with our security staff, our coaches, our administrators, our teachers, and, and engage the students. You know, student safety campaigns have to be a key part of this. As we know from the Magruder incident, students were there in that bathroom and they did not report that shooting to the police they posted on Twitter. We have to do a better job engaging our students in public safety campaigns and, and you know, bringing everyone to bear on this difficult challenge. So I would rather hire two you know, violence prevention staff in every high school than one police officer. I think we get a lot more out of it. And, and the, the point I really wanna make is we need to be doing more and not less. It's not enough to pull out a resource. We gotta add resources into the schools to deal with this mental health and violence crisis that we are experiencing. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Um, Mr. Hucker, you're next. You have two minutes. Uh, thanks, Caitlin. Um, I think the question really ought to be more broadly asked, how do we guarantee public safety and maximize public safety in our schools, not just about SROs? Um, a true commitment to student safety requires us, I believe, to make a real true commitment to student well-being and make that the priority. 
Um, and that begins with mental health. Uh, last spring, when I was council president, I pushed very hard to do what principals have been asking for and put one social worker in every classroom, 26 in our budget. Um, I, I had to support a council member Glass on that, probably others, but I could never get to five votes because uh, the county exec and his HHS did not want to put that in this budget, even though the superintendent was happy to pay MCPS funding in the budget for that. And that, that occurred until the, the, the final night before the, the budget vote. So they weren't funded in this budget. And predictably, all the MSW students graduated in May, and uh, we weren't advertising for the positions. We knew in, in classroom learning was gonna resume in September. We knew there was a predictable tidal wave of mental health problems in our, school, in our, our students coming forward, but we didn't advertise the positions. We finally were able to pass the supplemental uh, for 50 social workers in November. Uh, they began advertising them. They advertised them at too low, starting at $47,000, which is not adequate pay for a social worker. Um, and they've only been able to hire seven behavioral health workers, and I understand two social workers out of the 50. So we're way behind. They were hired by Prince George's County and Howard County and DC and other jurisdictions when we knew this was coming and we should have had at least one social worker in every school in this budget and we would have if I was the county executive. Two, we need uh, student security officers. Um, our SRO program was layered on top of the school security officers. Um, they, the principal has been asking for more security officers for years. Blair High School has the same number. They had 500 students ago and the principal asked for them. And unfortunately they just get one temporary security assistant even after the recent stabbing. And um, uh, third- oh, I'm sorry, yep. that's too Sorry. Come back to it, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you, Mr. Hucker. Mr. Elrich, you're next. You have two minutes. So, you know, we came up with a plan that took the officers out of the school, but kept them in the vicinity of the school because in working with the state, which oversees this, we had to have a plan that would, that showed that we'd have the ability to respond to schools, something more than just saying, call the police. So we put this plan in place. Um, obviously the anxiety over the incidents in school has increased and it has been a very slow higher up. I will point out that, uh, I asked the council and had conversations with council members about why not to put it in the budget first place because the council didn't fund the budget in its spending affordability guidelines at a level that could absorb those positions, which is one problem. But the other thing was Dr. McKnight was willing to use the ESSER funds they had from the federal government to pay for these over the first couple of years. So the agreement we reached and that we were working on is the school would hire these people over a couple of years, the county would reabsorb this cost into our budget as we anticipated our budget improving, but they were willing to cover it during the first year. So I did not see the point of adding something in, knowing that adding something in, if you don't raise taxes, we require taking other services out. Uh, working with the school system was preferable. Not only that, but Dr. McKnight outlined a two-year program of what they were gonna do to improve mental health programs in the school, not just the increase in uh, in mental health workers, but also what I thought was very interesting was a restorative justice program that would result in training and working with both students and staff. So she had a good plan. She has a good two-year plan. We're gonna to continue to work with them on that. Um, I support that you asked the question, do I support the decision we made? Yes, I do support the decision she made. I wanna emphasize, you know, part of that decision is that the officers will continue to not do anything but enforce criminal law. They are not going to be disciplinarians in the school. They're not going to patrol the halls. They're not going to enforce school discipline. They're there for criminal events, and that's all they're there for. So she's been pretty strong and clear that's what she wants, and I support her decision. Okay, thank you, Mr. Elrich. Uh, Mr. Blair, you have two minutes as well. So every student deserves to feel both respected and safe, and I believe that we can have that with a school resource officer. Um, the, the intent of the program clearly was violence protection, and then they can serve as mentors and also be part of our community outreach program. And of course, it was never meant to um, over-police our black and brown students or be engaged in you know, everyday disciplinary issues. When this matter took center stage, um, I reached out to students. In fact, one meeting I remember having was with 20 black students from Gaithersburg High School. And they raved um, in a positive way with their relationship with Officer Black. Um, and then on the other hand, 
um, I've seen firsthand um, teachers, students, or excuse me, students and parents um, feel fear and intimidation, and we should believe that. Um, but rather than getting rid of the program like we did last year and moving those resources away, um, I believe that there's an opportunity to fix it, to address it, to make it work for everybody, um, specifically as it relates to the new uh, community engagement officer that the superintendent has proposed. I think that's a really sound approach to move forward. I think clearly it's our superintendent, it's the principals, it's the parents, it's the students that know what's best for them. And this seems like a good approach. From a personal perspective, I remember, you know, when I was dropping off my daughter, it was her sophomore year. I remember dropping her off at school and it was one of those particularly bad years where there were school shootings across the country. And I felt safer knowing that there was a police resource there. So I think, I think we can do both. Um, I only have two minutes, so I can't jump into the, the, the mental health aspect of this, but, but clearly we have a mental health tsunami and we're gonna be needing to use every tool in our toolbox to address that as well. Okay, thank you, Mr. Blair. I, um, we've come to the point of rebuttals. I see um, Mr. Hucker has his hand up. Uh, you have 30 seconds. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Elrich mentioned that uh, the school system received $250 million in, in federal funds, uh, specifically to help with mental health. That's absolutely true. And that's why the uh, and mental health and many other things. And that's exactly why the superintendent supported my proposal to put a social worker in every school. It was the county exec and his HHS, and we can check the video, I'm happy to share it with everybody, that resulted in the HHS committee of the council voting down council member Glass's proposal, um, uh, advancing my proposal to put one social worker in every school. And the county exec says, well, I didn't see the point of funding them. I didn't see the point of funding them. The point is um, that, that parents and students struggling with mental health um, don't care what pocket the money comes from. The point is it's urgent. We've lost 10 of our students since January to overdoses and suicides. Um, we can't wait. And we don't care what pocket the money comes from. We need social workers and behavioral health workers in the schools to, to take care of our students. That's the whole that's point. Time. And that's why we don't have them. Thank you. Okay, I think I saw Mr. Reamer next. You have 30 seconds. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to say, I know that um, for many people, they feel that, that their children are safe around police officers. I, I think we also have to remember that a lot of people have more, they have a different perspective. And they're afraid that their children might not only be victimized by crime, but also not be treated appropriately by police. And we are seeing, we have seen that in our schools over the, time, over the years. So that is why I believe that there is a better approach to school safety that brings different kinds of professionals into the school setting and can prevent violence from happening without raising the potential harmful consequences that we have seen. Okay, thank you, Mr. Reamer. Mr. Blair, I believe I saw you next. You have 30 seconds. So we've gotta be doing everything we can to address the mental health challenges. We had, we had challenges before, COVID, now they've only gotten worse. And four years ago, I proposed bringing telehealth into all 126 of our elementary schools, um, which would have been, which was a phenomenal idea. And it, can you imagine the benefit today if we had done that? Because it's been proven that you can get as effective mental health counseling through telehealth as you can through in-person. And the benefit from it is we wouldn't be limited from a geography perspective to only recruiting within Montgomery County, which we all know is an incredibly expensive place to live. So telehealth, we also have amazing nonprofits. Blair, I'm sorry, that's 30. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Alrich, you have 30 seconds. So I'll just say, you know, in the real world where budgets matter, it makes a difference whether you have to make a choice inside your budget to fund one thing and defund something else. I'm trying to avoid the defunding of other critical services that this county provides. When the superintendent said they were willing to use their funds, that's the only reason I was willing to go ahead and say, let's use their funds and assure her that we would make them whole over a couple of years. We, the, there were nothing would have changed in terms of the timing. They started in this process. This was a budget for July 1, 2021. And whether it was us or whether it was them, the outcome would have been the same. Unfortunately, probably both of us would have Thank failed God. at recruiting people at those prices. 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, and it's back over to you for the next question. Um, 
Since 2020, at least three audits found significant shortcomings in the county police department on concerns such as racial inequity in vehicle searches and the lack of a requirement that internal affairs investigate all use of force incidents. Last year, five people died at the hands of law enforcement officers in the county, including Ryan LaRue, a 21-year-old black man fatally shot at a McDonald's drive through in Gaithersburg. Officers at the center of several severe use of force incidents remain on the force. Mr. Elrich initiated a reimagining public safety task force and has also complained to Bethesda Magazine that, quote, the council has legislated willy-nilly on police reform, end quote. Are county officials moving with sufficient urgency to meaningfully improve policing, ensure use of force is appropriate and equitable, and earn trust with communities of color? The order for this question will be Mr. Elrich, Mr. Blair, Mr. Reamer, and Mr. Hucker. Mr. Elrich, you have two minutes. Yeah. I think the issue of reforming police is really complex and it's not something that lends itself simply to legislation. Uh, if you've been with the police and talked to them as I have and gone over you know, video footage of some of the worst incidents that have occurred in Montgomery County, it's pretty clear that people are doing what they've been trained to do. And this is not something you can legislate your way out of. This is a matter of bringing in training. This is one of the reasons why the group the, that we retained, ELE4A, to do the analysis is looking at 20,000 body cameras for the footage of how officers do their job with these cameras. So they can see what is the difference between what we've trained people to do or expect them to do and what's actually performed on the scene. Um, we've already, and I, I guess uh, this got missed by people, um, the chief revised the traffic stop policy. I was very concerned about the way traffic stops were done in Montgomery County and they've changed the policy. So basically an officer can stop somebody, they go up and they tell them, this is what you did. They go back and write them a ticket and they come back and they say, thank you very much, go on your way. Unless they see a gun or a person in distress or something which is actionable, they are not to do the kind of fishing expeditions that is, that's really offended people in the community. Uh, I, I remember watching a video of a, a man, his wife, and his grandmother who they were helping move, and somebody in another car is coaching the officer to say, uh, ask them if they've got a body in their trunk, see if you can get into their trunk. It was just unbelievable, and it was not an isolated incident. It's not the only time that happened. So I asked them to rewrite the way they do the traffic stops so they can't do that kind of stuff. And we are exploring whether the, some of the stuff, particularly equipment- 15 value, seconds. We're exploring whether we can use cameras to give tickets for equipment failures rather than having officers stop a car for an equipment failure. I do think that it's important to keep officers involved in speeding and reckless driving and not leave that uh, to civilian or uh, camera enforcement. But um, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Elrich. Mr. Blair. So clearly, we have a problem, and not all of our residents are feeling safe and respected. I'm, the, the stats are alarming. The, the, our arrests, um, Black people account for 44% of our arrests, yet they only represent 18% of our population. Um, Blacks are three times more likely to get pulled over for a traffic violation um, than a white. And so clearly, there's we, we needed to reimagine public safety. And as I go through the reimagine report, I think that was your specific question. Um, there's many initiatives in there that make a lot of sense um, that we should pursue. Um, I think we're fortunate to have you know, Chief Jones, who's a leader in de-escalation and community policing, and we need to continue to build on those efforts. Um, recruiting a diverse workforce. We talked about the need to increase pay so that we're attracting and retaining the best and brightest officers. And then also certainly mental health professionals and how we can um, benefit from um, dispatching mental health professionals um, rather than police officers when appropriate. Um, so there's a lot of the positive things. Um, but I think it's worthwhile that we have to talk about the root cause. Like, let's, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper in what's underneath this, right? And think about the poverty that is, we've seen in this county emerge over the past 10, 20 years and the lack of economic opportunities that we have. It's estimated that 25% of our MCPS graduates were neither ready to go to college nor go have a career to earn a living wage. And so now you have so many of, um, young men and women that are earning minimum wage jobs. It doesn't have to be that way. We actually have great opportunities. We actually have great careers in Montgomery County that we're not connecting these men and women to. And so, uh, for example, like careers in auto tech. Um, I was at Montgomery College a couple months ago. It's all this phenomenal program where 
these young men and women are going to be earning sixty thousand dollars a year when they when they get out of that. It's a paid apprenticeship program. There's only forty young men and women in the program. Forty. We have seven hundred thousand cars in this county, and so so we've got to do a much better job of connecting, getting living wages um, to our residents as well as reimagining police. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Mr. Reamer. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I've been working on public safety reform for many years now, since before George Floyd, uh, since I was council president in 2018 and after the shooting of Robert White. And I began the county's first effort really to significantly change how we do policing by creating the Police Advisory Commission, working closely with the NAACP and identity. And I'm taking this on, I have taken this on for a lot of reasons, but among them are the fact that my two sons who are black, I know that when they are out in the community, they'll never be looked at the same way that I was looked at when I was a kid. And they may not get the same fair, uh, good faith from residents who might think that they're up to no good or an officer who might mistake them for someone who has committed a crime. And that to me is utterly unacceptable. I want my kids to be safe from crime and safe in their interactions with police work. So I have been leading this county on police reform. And I have to say, our county executive served as chair of the Public Safety Committee, did not take on police reform in any significant way. And as county executive, he has advocated for delay after delay after delay. I am the only candidate in this race, the only one who has publicly fought to repeal the Law Enforcement Office Officer's Bill of Rights to modify the Maryland Public Information Act so that police records would be actually able, you know, transparent and able to be uh, viewed by the community and so we could have effective discipline and you know you've got to have elected officials who are willing to fight for the community too many elected officials including the county executive have sided with the police union and you know, i stand with our police officers but i i am willing to go toe to toe with their union because their union has opposed reform at every single step and when they're right that's great but when they're wrong you need an executive who's going to get the right policies in place thank you Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Mr. Hucker. Um, thanks for the question. Um, Council Member Reamer uh, might, might be mistaken, might be uh, have forgotten. I, I've, I've advocated for years to repeal Leo Burr, the Law Enforcement Officer's Bill of Rights in Annapolis in past years, in this, in this past year. I'm supported by Senator Will Smith, who led the effort um, to get rid of the Law Enforcement Bill of, uh, Officer's Bill of Rights at the state level. On the use of force bill, I was a leader at passing uh, with Councilmember Jawando the use of force bill through the Public Safety Committee on which I serve. Um, I led the council's efforts to expand our mobile crisis response because we have too many um, individuals who are uh, in the community experiencing a mental health crisis and the only professional we have to send to those uh, uh, individuals is a, an armed police officer instead of a social worker. I'm glad that the council's been able to get the county executive support to fund that and to stand those up, but it's taken far too long. Caitlin was a hero of the county when she exposed the abuse of a grant a child at East Silver Spring Elementary School by two of our officers. That crime was hidden from us for 11 months um, by our police. And I had to pass legislation forcing the police to do reviews of body camera footage, bring that to the, to the attention of the public and the county executive and the county council and the state's attorney so that that never happens again. But the county executive is still fighting the civil suit from that from the Grant family's uh, family. We know that our officers abused this poor child. It's on videotape, it went around the world and, and earned us criticism worldwide. The county executive, it's, his two years have gone by, he should settle the case and give that family some peace instead of re-traumatizing them. And fifth, when I was county council president, I was given an award, the council was given an award for my leadership by the NAACP, which is a tough critic, and they should be, of the county council uh, and the county leadership. Uh, they said that we were the best council they'd worked with in 20 years, and they gave us an award for our uh, work leadership on civil rights and police reform. If I'm county executive, we're going to continue to be leaders and not laggards in civil rights and police reform. Thank you. Okay, it's time for rebuttals. I see some hands raised already. Mr. Elridge, 30 seconds. So a couple of things. One is the, the police officers in the school system are entitled to defense um, I think the thing should be settled. I've asked our attorneys to settle. I asked them to settle it before to the extent that the, that the victim's family has chosen to go to court, which is no doubt to maximize at least the number of charges or, or issues to get raised. 
or substantiated, that has delayed the settlement. I will say also that uh, last year, it would be more than a year ago, we negotiated with the police uh, the duty to intervene because as soon as we saw the footage of the cases of where the officers were sitting by, you know, we basically had a conversation saying the world's changing, policing is going to change, you guys got to intervene, and they agreed to doing that. Thank you, Mr. Elrich. Mr. Reamer. Thank you. Well, I would just like to say for the record, uh, last, it may have been two years ago now, Councilmember Jawando and I circulated a letter to the council and the county executive seeking elected officials to sign on in support of repealing the law enforcement officer bill of rights. The only other elected official who signed on was council member glass. Um, as so, you know, you need elected officials who are willing to stand up even when it is politically inconvenient. The county executive has not even been willing to require police officers to get vaccinated. You know, is he Thank going you. to go to bat for more difficult issues? Th Thank these you, are real Mr. Reamer. Um, any other rebuttals? Mr. Hucker. Um, uh, Council Member Reamer's right about the letter. I think it was like a 24 hour turnaround. I would have happily signed the letter. I have been advocating for repeal of the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights going back years uh, to when I was a state legislator and didn't serve on the House Judiciary Committee. It was unusual for me to be pushing for that, but I was among the reform minded legislators pushing for that. On the settlement, the county executive has been dragging this out. County Executive Duncan or Leggett would have settled this in a couple of weeks, but he offered the family just a few thousand dollars so that they would have lost money for going through this whole case. This child is traumatized. We should uh, uh, just admit we're wrong and do the right thing, um, but he's continued to drag it out. And that those are the facts. That's not a fact. It is. Talk to their That's attorney. Not... Okay, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Blair, are you looking for a rebuttal? No, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next question. The um, explosion at the Flower Branch Apartments in Silver Spring left seven people, including two children dead, nearly 40 people injured, and at least 80 families without homes. And another explosion Thursday at Friendly Garden Apartments, also in Silver Spring, injured 14 people and left 225 people displaced. Uh, early indications are that a cut gas pipe may have caused the explosion, the most recent explosion. These two calamities have had an outsized impact on renters, on moderate and low-income residents, on immigrants and communities of color. Pending a determination of the precise cause at Friendly Garden, has enough been done since the Flower Branch explosion to try to prevent such events anywhere in the county going forward? If not, what additional preventative moves should be taken? The order for this question will be Mr. Hucker, Mr. Reamer, Mr. Blair, and Mr. Elrich. Mr. Hucker, you have two minutes. No, not nearly, uh, not nearly enough has been done. Um, uh, first of all, I passed legislation. Uh, we don't regulate uh, gas utilities, unfortunately. Uh, the state does and the Public Service Commission. But I passed legislation because we regulate landlords, uh, forcing our landlords to report mercury regulators through uh, 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 to the Department of Housing and for them to report it to Washington Gas, which promised to re re remove all the mercury regulators that caused the Flower Branch explosion as soon as they find that out. Um, and and uh, Councilmember Reamer was uh, glad I was glad he co-sponsored the bill uh, and got it through his committee. Um, the Housing Department, as far as I know, as far as I've been able to tell, hasn't even started implementing that bill yet. It was emergency legislation. It should have been implemented on the day it was passed. They knew it was coming. They fought to water it down. And unfortunately, we still don't have the database of all the mercury regulators in the, in the county. Um, I heard from this, from my porch right here, the explosion and rushed there at Flower Branch and spent the entire night there. And I've continued to fight for those tenants and victims for five years. Um, when, when that happened, uh, um, the, the, the investigation and took far too long. We need to do everything we can in the county's power to bring them justice and the county should be re removing all those regulators. But the fact is um, there are hundreds of them in apartment buildings right now in Montgomery County where people are going to sleep tonight. Um, second, the building that blew up last week also in my district was not inspected by county inspectors, was not. And the county's uh, uh, CEO, a CE office, shared false information that it had been. The part of the complex had been inspected, but not that building. And you can just go to the housing department's website and see that in your own eyes, as I did. Um, if you look at the address, it wasn't inspected. And Fox 5 this morning, yesterday, reported that the county executive staff had shared the false information about that. We don't inspect nearly enough buildings. The county executive 
uh, suspended inspections of all our apartments in Montgomery 15 County seconds. for two years during COVID, which was crazy. We have people breathing mold and mildew and dealing with mice and, and all kinds of vermin every single year, every single week. They send me pictures and we need inspectors in all the buildings. We need to follow the law. When I'm county executive, I'm going to prioritize tenant health and safety and not ignore it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hucker. Mr. Reamer. Thank you. Um, well, this tragedy is really a, a difficult. And, you know, our hearts are going out to all of the residents at Friendly Gardens. There's actually a building services worker for the county council who lives there, and she's lost everything. Um, I don't think the county does enough to inspect these buildings. I do think it's important to keep in mind, though, there was no mercury regulator in this building. The cause of this problem was a very different cause. You said it yourself, it could have been a cut gas pipe, which might have been cut by someone working on it. Um, so what can we do to get gas out of buildings? That's, I think, an important conversation here. I believe in what is called electrification of the building sector, where we stop heating our homes and cooking our food with natural gas and we shift to electric sources of heating. Uh, in order to do that, we have to generate a lot more clean energy. We have to generate a lot more uh, solar and wind. And that's why I led the fight for solar uh, to be integrated with farming in Montgomery County. So I believe that the long-term solution is to get natural gas out of our buildings, and then we won't have these kinds of risks. But Multifamily buildings are not the only ones that blow up. We had a horrific explosion in a single family dwelling a couple of years ago in Rockville, you might remember. Uh, it's just more dangerous, I think, than we all may necessarily recognize. But um, you know, whether it is more aggressive inspections or uh, simply a bigger policy framework here that begins to transition our, our building sector to clean electricity, you know, I think we've got to be doing a lot more, and I will say, I think our county government oh, does, does, a, does a, a really good job helping families that are affected in these kinds of situations, and those families are gonna be taken care of and provided for. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Mr. Blair, you have two minutes. So the, this, uh, these accidents that you described are, are horrible and, and should never happen, and, um, and, and our hearts go out to the, the families that front the gardens. Um, I'm also proud of Montgomery County and how the generous response and how so many people have contributed and that makes me feel proud to live here. But as I think about the bigger picture here is um, why, why, are, why are these preventable accidents happening? And we'll, we'll eventually we'll find out the root cause and I don't want to speculate today. But Montgomery County is this incredibly rich county. There's 3,100 or so counties across the United States. We're the 17th most richest. So we're like top one tenth of 1%. And yet we struggle to, to pay for very basic things. I mean, the county's own report, if you go through it, we have like a $700 million backlog to fix sidewalks and street repairs. Even, even stormwater management, which is so critical to things like the flooding that we saw in Rockville last year, we have like almost a $50 million backlog. We have a $6 billion budget but it's not being managed well enough to get the money to where the people, the people and the things that need it. I ran a company that had a $6 billion budget. And every single year, you're starting at the bottom, you're figuring out what your priorities are, you're, you're stamping out the redundancies, you're leveraging new technology to make those dollars go farther. And that's what we need to do. Because we'll find out the root cause of this, and, and then maybe, maybe it is more code enforcement, maybe it is more inspections, but I would challenge the group that we need to figure out how to make that budget go farther. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Mr. Elrich, you have two minutes. Yeah, this, we, are, we are fortunate that, um, that the explosion in Silver Spring most recently did not lead to more deaths and more damage. And uh, having been out there to see that early on, uh, it was kind of an unbelievable scene. And I was really greatly relieved uh, when nobody came up um, uh, missing or dead. I, but on, on the issue of what happened, the pipe was cut. It was cut by a worker on the site. Um, they were doing plumbing work. They apparently mistook the, that pipe for a plumbing pipe. They cut it. Um, we don't know exactly what happened. Well, I'm not sure I haven't been told exactly what we were told happened after that. 
Um, but that's pretty clear what the cause of this was. And once you cut the pipe, it's, you know, you're going to fill those rooms with gas. And you can see from the explosion, the explosion occurs from the bottom of the building and blows it out. It also raises the roof, which was an incredible scene. Um, there are a couple of things we th I think we can do. You know, if they were experienced plumbers, and if this was actually black pipe instead of uh, not black pipe, they would have known that what they were cutting was a gas line, not a water line. And so the question is, what's the training required for people who act as custodial staff? If someone's in there as a maintenance worker and can't tell the difference between water and gas lines, they probably shouldn't be doing that. We may need to require that all these companies have licensed plumbers and electricians on site to do plumbing and electrical work. Uh, the easiest thing to require would be painting of all these lines uh, with a color so that everybody knows that if it's painted this way, assuming that being a black pipe isn't sufficient, um, that a person knows they're dealing with a gas line and, 15 seconds. and not a water line. So we will be sending over some correctives, but there is nothing that you can do to correct human error except for probably have trained that person in a way that he would have recognized that he was dealing with gas, not water. But that Thank you. is pretty clear. Thank you, Mr. Elrich. Um, does anyone want a rebuttal? Mr. Hucker. 30 um, seconds. And first, I very much agree with uh, uh, Councilmember Reamer about the need to upgrade our unsafe buildings. And that's why not only are the biggest buildings are our biggest source of carbon pollution, they're also unsafe, far too many of them. And that's why I proposed and passed the Green Buildings Now Act, which puts $100 million available on the street every year for green retrofits of our building stock, not just insulation and new windows and solar panels, but also upgrades to their HVAC system to make them safer and more efficient. That's going to save our building owners money, but it's going to save our tenants money, both commercial and residential, and make our buildings a lot safer so we don't have these type of explosions. Um, second, it's- it was, Thank you, Mr. Hawker. Oh, that's 30 oh, seconds. Yeah. Mr. It, it is it is required to have a, a master plum a journeyman plumber in the Washington uh, service area the Washington suburban sanitary WSSC service. Mr. Reamer. Well, I want to compliment Mr. Hucker on his legislation for funding the Green Bank, and I'll note that I actually added an amendment to that bill that prohibited the use of those funding those funds on natural gas. Um, and we've got to pass the building energy performance standards legislation, which Mr. Blair has said we shouldn't be taking up at all, that we should be deferring to regional approaches, I guess, waiting for Virginia to act first. So you need a county executive who is looking down the road here and willing to make some tough decisions. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Mr. Elrich. So quickly, we sent over the, uh, the bill to the BEPS bill over almost a year ago now expecting it to be done. And so we're still waiting for it to be finished. I also wanna point out that the county has not, not inspected buildings for two years, what Mr. Hucker said. He got a letter last July informing him that we had resumed inspection of the buildings on July 1st last year. And that in the interim, the one year we weren't doing it, we were actually doing complaint-based inspections, but we weren't doing general inspections. We did that because it was unsafe to send workers into those buildings. Thank you, Mr. Elrich. Uh, Mr. Blair, did you have your hand raised? No, I was going to respond to Councilman Reber, but I, I, let's just keep focusing on, on the core issues. Can you continue? Okay. Um, Caitlin, next question is to you. Okay, thank you. Um, officially, the county executive and county government have some budget authority over Montgomery County Public Schools, but no day-to-day -day operational authority. So what's the role of the county executive of the county of, excuse me, what's the role of the executive in supporting and improving education in the county and in creating an educated citizenry and workforce? Um, the order for this question, Mr. Blair, Mr. Elridge, Mr. Hucker, Mr. Reamer, Mr. Blair, you're up first with two minutes. Great, thank you. So the, the county executive plays a critical role in education and, and really think about it as connecting the dots because for far too long, Montgomery County has operated in these silos. And, and the, dot, the dot starts with early childhood education, right? So these are the programs for the zero to three-year-olds and they're, they're proven across the country to help address the achievement gap. So it starts with the zero to three, clearly pre-K has gotta be a priority for our county. Um, then we think about K through 12, then you got to go into Montgomery College and then USG and then the actual careers, because far too many of our students aren't getting career ready. They don't have it. They can't earn a living wage. 
So I think the county executive can connect all of those dots. And then as it relates specifically to the MCPS budget, th this doesn't have to be a, a contentious document that is you know, sent over a wall, right? I very much wanna have a collaborative relationship with the superintendent and the board of education and understand what are their priorities? What are my priorities? So for example, as I think about our government, our, how the school system can better help us, not only is it making sure that our kids are college or ready, but how can we do a better job buying local, right? We have fresh fruits and vegetables in our ag reserve. We have all kinds of service providers that our schools need. Think about, there's something called the FAFSA. It's the free application for federal um, assi uh, uh, assistance for students. Many jurisdictions are requiring this as part of graduation. So that's a great idea because often a barrier for someone to go to on to higher education is they didn't get that complicated form filled out. So I think about the county executive as um, connecting the dots and then aligning interests, right? So we talked about mental health and how important that is. So clearly that's a priority of the superintendent. It would be a priority for me as county executive and how can we best tackle that together? So that's how I think about the county's executive role in, um, in education. Sorry, thank you, Mr. Blair. Um, Mr. Elrich, you are next with two minutes. So the county's responsibility is to fund the schools minimally at the maintenance of effort level. And we've often gone beyond maintenance of effort. Maintenance of effort means that you have to adjust last year's budget for population growth and, and um, inflation. And, and we've been doing that historically. But the council sets spending affordability guidelines on both capital bonding and also operating budgets for the schools. And within our tight budgets, and I will say we all work with, with our revenue projections, the council has not provided adequate funding for either the capital side of the school requests or the operating sides of the school requests. And so we've sent over, for example, this year and last year, a capital budget that exceeded the guidelines, but you can't build the schools in the schools program if you don't have the money in your budget to actually build the school. So we have a choice of either funding as much of it as we can or funding what the guidelines call for and knowing that not all the schools are gonna be built. Um, so that, that's a problem. The fact that the school system's budget is disconnected from the county's budget, unlike all the other budgets, is something we really need to work on because they develop their budget without knowledge of what our, what our projections are. They're making assumptions about where they can go and how much the budget can, their budget can grow absent the latest information from the county. And so we've talked with them, particularly this year, there's a really big gap between what the schools asked for and what the spending affordability guidelines are. We've talked with them about working in future years to align ourselves more closely so everybody has a better understanding of what the resources are in the county so we can make better, better use of the resources and do better planning. Uh, the county can only give these large sums of money. We can give it to a few categories, but we don't have the ability to tell them on a programmatic basis what they're going to fund specifically and what they're not going to fund. So the role of the county, I think, is to be supportive, both, both verbally, but also financially, and make sure they get the resources they need. We're trying to, we've tried to do this every year I've been here. Sorry, Mark, that's yep. true. Thank you. Um, okay, Mr. Alrich, um, next up is Mr. Hucker. You have two minutes. Um, it, it's, it's just uh, now, now, now everybody can see, sees what we're dealing with. It was funny to hear the county executive said, we need to work on this. I'm sure many members of the public are wondering why you haven't in the last four years, because we have we have stovepipe budget approach, which we absolutely should get rid of, not just begin working on it in year five. Um, the role of the county executive to answer your question is to be the number one advocate for and leader fighting for our schools and then to go to Annapolis and be the number one lobbyist for our schools. Our schools are the crown jewel of Montgomery County. They're the number one reason people move here. They're the number one uh, driver of economic development in Montgomery County. And they have been sliding year after year and the racial equity gap has been a growing and growing the opportunity gap. Our black and brown students have fallen farther behind over the last several years. Um, so the county executive needs to one, listen to educators and parents and fight for everything they want in the school's budget. Two, bring people together and convene 
uh, uh, the Board of Ed, the superintendent, and other stakeholders like our nonprofits to make sure they're getting everything they want in the budget. And then number three, uh, get it through the council, lobby for their priorities to, through the council, and go to Annapolis and fight for your priorities as well for every dollar that Montgomery County deserves. I'll do that when I'm county executive. I'll be in Annapolis all the time. I served there for eight years. I have great relations there. I'll be, I'll be on the phone working with, just like Doug Duncan did, just like Ike Leggett did, fighting for every dollar that our taxpayers and our students and parents deserve. And finally, then you have to get out of the way and let the school system run the school system uh, and not micromanage it. But where you have priorities like closing the reading gap, I have fought for that even as council president and convened our multi-hour uh, uh, focus groups to fight for those kind of dollars in the budget. The county executive has far more power to do the exact same thing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hucker. Mr. Reamer, you have two minutes. All right. Thank you. Well, uh, this is probably my favorite topic, and it's one that, of course, I, I feel personally as the parent of two students in MCPS, uh, two students who, frankly, um, haven't done as well as they might have done over the past year, uh, two years, as I think a lot of families uh, have experienced their kids not making the progress that they expected they would expect that they would make. Um, as county executive, uh, I am going to be a hands-on leader for education in Montgomery County. And I'm not going to step back and let the school system simply run on autopilot as I, I believe is happening now. Um, I'm gonna have a special assistant in my office who's gonna work with me collaboratively with the superintendent and the board of education and the parent community and the advocacy groups to move forward on an agenda. We are going, we have to have an all hands on deck approach now to recover from COVID. Our kids have not made the progress that they needed to make. And we have to bring every resource to bear to support their recovery. And that's gonna to have to be a multi-year strategy. I also wanna say, I have been disappointed and um, frankly upset about what has happened over the past couple of years. And especially this year, the county executives most important job this year was a successful return to school for MCPS students in September. And it did not happen. It did not happen. And then the next most important job was a successful return for MCPS schools uh, students in January. And it did not happen. And that is, I believe, because our county executive is not adequately engaged in managing through this crisis and bringing the decision makers together at the table. And as county executive, you can bet I want my kids in school. That's why I was the only council member to vote against the executive's proposal to allow drinking in bars late at night when the schools were closed. I want my kids in school and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that that happens. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Okay, we are at rebuttals. Um, I saw Mr. Elrich first, I believe you have 30 seconds. You're on mute. First, first of all, I've been working with the legislature since I got elected. I worked on the Kerwin Commission report. I got all the county executives to come together and agree on a unified approach when we were testifying because we didn't want that bill picked apart because each county took a different approach to funding. We wanted to make sure we could get that money. We worked and we got a change in school funding for construction where now we're going to get reimbursed at a 50% rate for many of our buildings, as opposed to the previous 20 or 22% rate. We did that because we doggedly pursued this until we eventually got it. Mr. Um, Rich, I'm sorry, that's okay. 30 seconds. Um, let's see, Mr. Hucker, I saw you next. Uh, you have 30 seconds as well. Well, yeah, just quickly, uh, Caitlin, we set spending affordability guidelines as a team. The council sets them, the county executive has never come over and proposed higher spending affordability guidelines. He's never come over and testified for anything or appeared for all the oversight hearings that we've held. Um, he, he's been spending over budget like a drunken sailor, 90 million for hazard pay without council approval until he already spent 30 million and we uncovered it. 70 million, we just found out he blew through the HHS budget uh, without the council ever finding out about that. He's, the money's already out the door, off the books, and we have to figure out where that's going to come from. So of course we need to send him for the guidelines, but the county executive could propose a different one if he doesn't like the ones we have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hucker. Uh, Mr. Blair, you have 30 seconds. So when I was when I was growing up here, Montgomery County every year, you would look at the U.S. News and World Report, and you'd see several of our high schools in the top 100 in the country, and that's no longer the case. And as I've met with um, the various governor candidates, um, this is what I stress. Um, 
The state of Maryland will go as Montgomery County goes. Montgomery County will go as MCPS goes. We've got to do more to get our schools right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we will turn it back over to you now. Great, thank you. Um, we were fortunate today to be joined by um, hundreds of readers who registered um, for this forum and they have been submitting very astute questions. Um, and we're gonna share a couple of those with the panel. I think we're gonna to get to two, hopefully, but we're gonna do this as sort of a speed round. Um, candidates will have one minute to answer and 30 seconds to rebut. Here's the first one. Joanna Silver asked a question about Police Chief Marcus Jones. Candidates, would you keep Chief Jones if you are elected or reelected? The order for this question will be Mr. Hucker, Mr. Reamer, Mr. Blair, Mr. Eldridge. Mr. Hucker, you have one minute. Uh, I think it's way premature, very premature to talk about personnel decisions. Thank you for your brevity. Um, Mr. Reamer. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, I have a good constructive relationship with Chief Jones um, and I haven't been happy with all of his decisions and, and all of the actions of the police department. But I also really respect his career. And as county executive, I would work to provide Chief Jones with my vision for how we are going to improve policing and reform policing. And I will work with him on making that a success. And if the police chief isn't successful in implementing my agenda as county executive, then I would hire a new police chief. But I, I wanna work with Chief Jones and see what we can get done. And uh, that'll be my approach. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Mr. Blair. Yes, I've, I've had an opportunity to, to meet with, with Chief Jones and have found him um, to be uh, a great leader. And he certainly has the, all the experience that we need. He's someone that, that I'm no doubt that I can work with and that we can address the concerns that we have. I think we're, we're fortunate in Montgomery County to have Chief Jones as our Chief of Police. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Mr. Elrich. So I've, I've worked with him successfully when I asked him to deal with the duty to intervene and changing the protectual stops. And for me, and you know, I'm probably similar to Mr. Reamer, the big issue is gonna be, we're gonna put an agenda um, of serious changes that have to be undertaken from training to procedures inside the police department. And I'm hoping that he's willing to lead on that. You know, I've, you know he's been, cooperative with us. He's worked with us. Uh, I'm hopeful that he'll look at this agenda and he'll say this is the where policing needs to go and he'll be supportive and that'll be you know what decides whether we stay with the leadership we have or we change leadership. But the most important thing is changing the department and we need support to do that. Any rebuttals? Okay. Um, question number two. Uh, Oriel Sa asked about uh, MCPS student drug overdoses. Candidates during the pandemic, students have overdosed on drugs and died by suicide. What should the county do to address these issues? The order for this question will be Mr. Elrich, Mr. Blair, Mr. Reamer, and Mr. Hucker. Mr. Elrich, you have one minute. So I'm optimistic that eventually MCPS will deal with its um, the hiring issue of social workers, though I will say, you know, everybody is dealing with this very same problem, but hopefully we'll get beyond that. I would like to see the county have a more robust system of clinics, mental health clinics in the county, uh, so people can take advantage of that. Um, I think the absence of that, absence of that has left many families unable to afford mental health care, which is stunningly expensive. And the county, the old county clinic system had sliding scales and was affordable to everyone. So I think the, you know, reintroduction of clinics of that nature would be something we should be looking at. Thank you, Mr. Elrich. Mr. Blair. So we, we, we've, we've heard a couple of times that we don't have enough social workers and counselors to address a number of things such as um, even with, with drug abuse, drug overdoses. Um, we gotta think creatively. And so as I've talked to principals and other leaders within our education system, what I found is a number of our social workers and uh, school counselors, they're actually bogged down in a lot of administrative work. So they're actually not even able to give 100% of their time to their current job. And so if we're struggling to recruit 
counselors, um, an easy pivot might be, okay, let's hire some admin individuals that can help offload that work from our social workers and our counselors so they can do the job um, that they were hired to do. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Mr. Reamer. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Oriel. Uh, the mental health crisis for our students is one of the most disturbing consequences of COVID. And I talk to families all the time whose kids have had suicidal ideations, who have suffered terribly from the loss of their whole social life and connections. And it is one reason why I am so passionate about getting our kids back in school in person successfully this year and why we have to embrace normalcy now while we can. We don't know what the future of COVID will bring. There could be another variant here today or there could be another surge next winter. But while we are more safe, which we are, we have got to get our 15 kids seconds. To back to the life of social con connectivity and, and identify those challenges with mental health staff in the schools so that we can find those kids and get them the support that they need. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Mr. Hucker. Um, thanks, Sam. We heard the county exec say that we should eventually have more community mental health uh, services. We shouldn't have them eventually, we should have them today. It's an emergency. We just lost 10 students. That's never happened in Montgomery County history. So one, uh, we should treat it like an emergency. Two, you do that by raising the pay, hiring temps for our short-term problem while we continue to look for long-term social workers as well and pay them adequate for their school, for their, for their skill level and their, their professional expertise. We should have had 26 social workers in the high schools in this budget like I wanted. We sh should have started much earlier to hire the 50 that we eventually, the council eventually funded. They need to be able to do treatment and referrals. And finally, we need a mental health diversion program for youth in Montgomery County. My wife helps run one of those in DC so that kids with undiagnosed mental health uh, challenges that get in trouble with the law aren't just in the criminal justice system forever. They can get wraparound services um, based with their working with their families and, and uh, get the treatment they need and be on a much better path. We should have had that in Montgomery County a long time ago. If DC and other jurisdictions have one, there's no reason we can't in Montgomery County. But community mental health, the county executive is right. We've needed that for four years for sure. I have friends and neighbors who have had to refer their children to out of state services. And I've talked to our HHS director and he says, yeah, we just don't have enough here. It's really a, a terrible how little we have uh, in Montgomery County for our teens that are undergoing mental health challenges. Nobody in Montgomery County should have to send their kids to other, other uh, jurisdictions out of state um, rather than pro being provided services we need that are vital right here in Montgomery County. And our budget needs to reflect that priority. When I'm county executive, Thank that's what it will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hucker. Any rebuttals? Okay. Um, on that note, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, there's so much more that we would love to ask, but we appreciate your time on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, on behalf of Caitlin and me and all of us at Bethesda Beat and Bethesda Magazine, thank you to the candidates for sharing their views. Thank you to you, the audience members, for choosing to spend your time with us, learning about the candidates ahead of the primary election, which is still scheduled for June 28th. Uh, please keep an eye out for more events we're planning, and please keep reading and supporting Bethesda Magazine and Bethesda Beat. We appreciate you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. My cell phone's in the chat if you want it. Thanks so much. Bye, Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye.